Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. This is Lecture 5, and I'm Vicki Colvin. We're in the middle of a module that's really talking about error in measurement. And what I want to do in this module is just go over something that you should instinctively know, which is that your ability to understand and characterize the error in a measurement is going to improve if you make replicate or identical measurements. And it's through the application of identical measurements that you can actually get a really good fix on what the spread is in your measurement. So you can actually characterize the random error or calcul calculate the precision of the measurement. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So uncertainty is a funny thing. And I include this quote, which actually comes from a really interesting uh, piece of reading, if you'd like to take a look. It's actually a standards manual produced by an international standards organization. And I think the most important thing about this definition, if you read it, is that uncertainty, which I think we intuitively know is our doubt, is actually a number. And it's a number, so when you're making a quantitative measurement using some instrument like a mass spectrometer, you're also going to have to have a measure of your uncertainty. It's not really appropriate to make a guesstimate of it. Ideally, you want to actually know it. And to do that, you're going to have to think through how to do replicate measurements, because you're going to always have doubt in a measurement. You're not going to be sure exactly how precise it is, because you might not know the true, true value. But you're going to have to characterize how much uncertainty, how doubtful are you? And remember, that's a quantitative number. And there's a process by which we arrive at that quantitative number that's the subject of today's lecture. So what we're going to do to get at our uncertainty is we're going to do the same measurement over and over and over and over again. So we're going to make a measurement using, let's say, an analytical balance. And we already know from the manufacturer, as we talked about in the last lecture, that its instrument tolerance is 0 0.0001. So you might say, well, I already know what my error is in the measurement. If I make a bunch of measurements, my error should be point plus or minus 0 0.0001. The problem is that the instrument tolerance that's written is kind of the dream. It's the very best case. Maybe your samples are dirty. Maybe there's wind that's you know buffeting the analytical balance. Well, that could be a little odd. Maybe the analytical balance has not been calibrated recently or something that's leading to some source of random error that's peculiar to your lab or your technique or your sample. So the very best way to get at the true error, the true random error, is to make replicate measurements. You weigh your keychain that you're going to be dissolving to measure lead once. You weigh it again and again and again and again. And you do it a whole bunch of times. And then you take an average of those measurements to get at what you hope is the true measurement value. And the standard deviation of those measurements will become what's called your error bar. Now, an interesting fact, besides the fact that that error bar that you get from doing replicate measurements, first of all, should be larger than the instrument tolerance. And it's going to be equal to the standard deviation of the measurement. So let's talk about that a little bit. So that measurement, then, is going to have an average plus or minus an uncertainty. And it's interesting what it actually means. So in a Gaussian distribution, the standard deviation is actually equal to a population of measurements that's roughly 68%. And let me explain that a little bit better. So what you see here on the left is a classic Gaussian bell curve. And you see minus sigma and plus sigma, and it's shaded dark blue. Now, what's interesting is the fraction of the curve that's in that dark blue regime is actually. And that's an interesting number because it says that in the future, if you continue to take measurements, of having them fall or within plus or minus sigma. If you went to two sigma, that's 95%. And that's going to be important in our next section. But for now, I hope you can understand that when you report a standard deviation as a plus minus error bar with no other information, first of all, any chemist looking at that is going to assume it's a standard deviation of replicate measurements, unless you tell them otherwise. And what it's also telling you is that when you take future measurements, there's a 63% chance that they're going to fall in this regime. So this example is really easy to do. Um, you might want to pause and try to do it yourself. I'm asking you to calculate the average and the standard deviation of this set of measurements. So you're going to have to find the STDEV button on your calculator. Once you do that, you have to think about how to report it. And there's going to be some discussions that we'll have about significant figures. But you might want to pause now, try to do this on your own, and then listen to how I tackled it. Well, the first thing to notice about this example is that we've got an odd significant figure situation. 
So we definitely have four sig figs, but we can see that they only go to the tenth decimal place in ppm. But as is usually the case, we're going to try to keep four ppm. So when we take the average of the six measurements, I report to the four part per million, four significant figures of parts per million. And then when I did the standard deviation, I also report that to four SFs. Now we're going to, in the final, in the final stage, we're going to change this, but this is just what came, come out of, came out of the calculator. Now to report it, we don't want to just say 101.0 plus or minus 1.851 ppm because these two digits would actually be over reporting. So we want to match how we report the error bar with the number of digits that are here. So for example, we only know the tenth place. So we better make sure that we only report the tenth place in our error. So for example, this is a good way to report the absolute error because what I'm doing is I'm giving the PPM only to the same significant figure place as my average, and that would be acceptable. And to report the percentage, it's a little bit different. You could report the percentage to one or two decimal places, but you would never do three. And that's simply because it's really over-reporting. When you report an error bar, it should never have more significant figures than your average. And because it's a plus minus in an absolute error bar, you have to match the level of precision and the significant figures, of course, to the answer because this is actually a form of addition, whereas in this case, it's actually a form of multiplication. And by the way, if you did, for example, use 2% to calculate the error, you would let the number of significant figures here govern what answer you might get out, and then you would round it appropriately. So it's actually a pretty simple thing to report replicate errors. It's actually a real, much more time consuming thing to do in a laboratory. But in this example, which is a lecture class, you can handle and, and understand replicate errors no problem at all. One important thing about replicate errors that I want to make sure you got is that it's a really interesting question. How much better you, do you do by taking more and more replications? Meaning, when do you stop? Well, we're going to talk more about that later, but just to give you an example. Let's say you did four measurements and you got a certain standard deviation and you went, uh-oh, that's too big. My spread is too big. I need to be more precise. Well, if you took 16 measurements or four times more, you should gain about half or a factor of two smaller error bars because standard deviation goes with the square root of one over the number of measurements. So if you did 16 measurements, you're going to gain a factor of two. Now, if you want to gain another factor of two, unfortunately, you're going to have to make 64 measurements, which is a lot, right? So if you want to gain another factor of two, it's not as easy to go from four to 16 is a lot easier than to go from 16 to 64. And if you want to do even better, you're going to be looking at hundreds of measurements. So that's one of the things to keep in mind about replicant measurements. It's kind of a law of diminishing returns because it's basically a one over square root to the n. Going for more and more and more measurements, eventually you're really going to have a hard time per measurement getting the same gain in reducing your spread. So with that, I wanted to leave you with that concept to ponder. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.